Welcome back to the Grumpy Historian's Guides and we're looking again at the Pillars of the Earth. This time I'm going to give you two episodes for the price of one. Episodes four and five. I've taken a shot here of a historical note because I wanted to remark on one thing. Um, Maud was not known as Princess Maud. She was known as the Empress Maud for reasons that I will unfold later. Episode four is entitled Battlefield and obviously starts with a battle. Now, this is from about halfway through the episode, but I wanted to remark on this because it shows um, a knight's charge. Now, the main thing that's wrong with this picture here is you see the line here. It's staggered. There's men all over the place. The main point of a knight's charge in the Middle Ages, which was one of their main ma military tactics, was that the line of men with spears or lances would remain unbroken. The point of that was that the full force would strike the enemy all at once. I mean, you imagine it, a row of about 100 knights, all on horseback, with lances, pointing at you. That's going to be a pretty big force to hit the enemy. And that was the purpose of it. The line did not break. That would have been pretty deadly for the people making the charge to break the line like that. And I remember someone at a battle recreation many years ago told us that, unlike what you see in movies, they did not gallop their horses into battle, because horses gallop at different paces. They would canter so that all the horses would keep the same pace and the line would be straight it would be unbroken when it basically crashed into the enemy line the other thing wrong with these images here that i very handily circled for you is the shields these are not the type of shields that would be used in the mid 12th century when this is set these round shields are the type of thing you'd expect to see in the well not see you would expect to have found in the 9th, 10th century, 200 years before, the Bayer Tapestry and an illustration I've found here and very handily again circled for you, shows people using kite-shaped shields. These are the 12th century type, not the ones you see here. They're centuries out of date. In fact, this whole sequence with the battle scene in episode 4, the weapons, the armour, they look as though they've just cobbled a load of stuff together from the costume department or from other productions. It's confused, it's messy, and it just looks silly. Also note that neither William Hamley nor Richard are wearing helmets, though I'll give them that. It's a common movie trope because the audience has to be able to see who's who. This, however, I will not give them any leeway with. Look at this scene here that I've circled again. This is the part after the battle in which a bunch of, I don't know what they are, meant to be random blue painted barbarians get let loose in the town and of Lincoln. What on earth? Is, I mean, what is that he's holding in his hand? Is it some sort of club or cosh? And look, another blue painted guy with dreadlocks. What on earth are these meant to be? Are they meant to be Scottish or something? I mean, this is like blue he blue face paint is the standard depiction of Scottish people since Braveheart. And he seems to be wearing some sort of tartan, but there's no evidence that whatsoever that there were Scottish soldiers in Queen Matilda's army. There is some evidence for Flemish mercenaries, but Flemings did not look like this. They just rolled out, you know, the standard uh, barbarian characters. I would also add the caveat that um, Chris Piers, who wrote a book on... King Stephen and the Anarchy, which was this war, said that there were Welsh soldiers in Maud's army. But again, if these people are meant to be Welsh, I take offence on behalf of the Welsh people here. These are not Welsh. So moving on to episode five, because I promised you two episodes for the price of one, watch this scene very carefully. Do you see these people before us, Henry? Yes, Mama. They've come to ask us favours. Do you know why? You're the Queen. I'm the Empress. I've rechristened myself this morning, and one day you will be emperor, and people will... So what's wrong with this scene? Well, for a start, just for a start, it makes out that Matilda just decided one morning to wake up and call herself empress on a whim. That is not the case. That is not what happened. There was one simple reason why Matilda was known as Empress. It was because before she married the father of her children, Geoffrey of Anjou, she had been married to the Holy Roman Emperor Henry V. And there was a tradition in the medieval period that if a woman had been married more than once, she would retain to the title of her highest ranking husband rather than her most recent husband. And because the Holy Roman Emperor obviously outranked Count of Anjou, she retained the title of Empress for the rest of her life. That is why she was known as the Empress Matilda, or 
more often the Empress Mort, not because she suddenly decided to call herself Empress one morning because she liked it. That's just silly. Though, of course, she wasn't Holy Roman Empress in any, any real sense of the term. It was more of a courtesy title. The other thing that's wrong here is she says to her son, one day you will be Emperor. No. Holy Roman Emperor. The position and title of Holy Roman Emperor was not hereditary. It was elective. They had to be elected. One couldn't just pass it on to one's son or daughter. And as I say, if she wasn't Holy Roman Empress in any real sense of the term, there would have been another Holy Roman Emperor by then. He would have been married, there would have been really another Holy Roman Empress in the real sense of the term. So that's why she was known as Empress. It was a hangover from her marriage to the Holy Roman Emperor. It wasn't just because she suddenly decided to call herself that. That's silly. That said, he was sometimes known in later life as Henry Fitz Empress, which it means Henry, son of the Empress. There's this part, the exchange of prisoners most notably King Stephen for Robert, Earl of Gloucester. Now, again, this did happen in real life, but it did not happen the way that they show it. It didn't happen very shortly after the Battle of Lincoln. What basically happened is about six months after Lincoln, there was another battle in London. Um, Matilda, I think it was Robert of Gloucester, was holed up in London alongside Matilda. And according to a military historian that I was reading on this matter, um, Stephen's wife, I know, actually led the forces there to a big victory in London and because of that they had to negotiate and negotiated for Stephen's release in exchange for Robert Earl of Gloucester who was taken prisoner by King Stephen's wife in London. Now just to make things a bit more confusing, King Stephen's wife was also called Matilda. Yeah, Queen Matilda, not Empress Matilda. It gets confusing because people are all called by the same name. So again, this did happen, but it happened months and months and months later. And also, unlike what you see in the movie here, Empress Matilda did not give the order to kill Stephen's son. He gave him up as a hostage, which was just something that they did then. But generally speaking, they didn't kill hostages. There could be exceptional examples where this did happen, but it was very rare, especially as they were both, they were all royals, you know, they were all cousins and children and great-grandchildren of William the Conqueror, they would afford, have afforded each other the courtesy of not killing each other. Oh look, another battle scene. Now remember what I said in the last episode about how the costumes and the formations aren't very realistic. It's the same thing here. I mean, look here at Richard's helmet. What on earth is he wearing? That is not a 12th century helmet. That actually, to me, looks like a 7th century Anglo-Saxon helmet that was discovered oh, many years ago now. It's called the Benty Grange helmet. I'll put up a picture of that, actually. I mean, all the weapons, the armour here, they just look like they've been cobbled together from the costume department. Some of them are from different time periods. I mean, what's going on with that axe there? That's not a medieval battle axe. That looks like it's made of plastic. It might even be made of plastic. I mean, call me um, pedantic if you want, but it just, it's odd. Look at his armour. It's just very, very strange looking. So they look like they've just cobbled it together from the costume department with various bits and pieces that they've had lying around. There's a few lovely dovey scenes in episode 5 as well, including this one between um, Jack and Aliena. But what I wanted to remark on here is the conversation about the book that she's reading. Song of Roland. It's about this knight who has a big horn and he blows it so hard that his head bursts. You know it? No, that's not what the Song of Roland is about. So briefly, the Song of Roland was a 12th century French, um, I would say poem, it's not really a poem, it's more a prose work, and it, but it's not about a man with a big horn who blows it so hard his head explodes. It's basically a battle poem. It's about a nephew of Charlemagne called Roland, who supposedly in the 8th century, 9th century, um, got cut off at a mountain pass, heading back home, ambushed by a massive Saracen army, makes a heroic last stand and dies very bravely. Yes very long poem basically just about a battle really it's what's known as the chanson de guest one of the songs of great deeds of chivalry it's it's interesting enough but it's not about what they say it is i mean honestly why even remark on a work of medieval literature if you don't know what it's about 
I'm not saying that in terms of the characters, I mean I mean that in just in terms of the programme. They clearly haven't read the Song of Roland. This kind of grates on me because it was one of the first works of medieval literature I ever did read, and they've just got it totally wrong. It's just it's just like name dropping. Downfall, which is hatred of God and church and morality. I love God. Though I don't worship her quite the same way as you do. Now I've chosen to to um, showcase this part in which um Jack gets fired basically and to continue work on the cathedral he has to become a monk because it illustrates how um Alienus character not Alienus, sorry, Ellen, Tom's lover, is just totally a modern interpolation. I mean this part in which she says, I love God, I just don't serve her the same way as you do is like what so she thinks God is female. There wasn't a single religious movement in the medieval period who believed that. There were some so-called quote unquote heretical movements, but none of them believe such a thing. And this isn't even in the book. I don't even know why they've put that in there. Maybe to show that she believes in modern 21st century feminist theology. I don't know. But why? I mean, when you have a character in a story, I like them there to be a reason for their beliefs. If they're kind of different from the time period, if they go against the grain, I like there to be a logical basis for it. There isn't one with Ellen. She's just this modern woman that's been shoehorned into this 12th century setting. And there's one interesting thing actually to note about this adaptation is that in the book, she actually does marry Tom Builder and they live together for four years in the same house with Martha, um, Alfred and her son Jack. In this version, she refuses to marry him. Um, he repeatedly asks her, but she refuses to. So they just meet for the odd romantic assignation in her cave. Now, no reason is given for that. Maybe, oh, she doesn't believe in marriage, but it's interesting the way they've changed the book in that regard. I want to make a confession, Father. Now, this is the final part I've recorded here because this represents one of my pet hates in medieval dramas and movies. She goes up to Prior Philip, this lady who turns out to be a prostitute, she's sister of one of the uh, monks. Um, it, the idea is to play a practical joke on him and she actually flashes at him. But the point here is that she refers to him as father. Philip is not a priest. Father is what you call a priest. He is not a priest, he's a monk. And she goes up to him ostensibly to make a confession. They didn't make confession to monks. You could only make confession to a priest. This is the thing that annoys me. One of my absolute pet hates is when they conflate monks and priests and confuse their different roles and functions within the medieval church hierarchy. As I say, you couldn't make confession to a monk, only a priest. You didn't call monks father, they called them brother or prior. Medieval people would have known the difference between a monk and a priest, but clearly modern movie makers don't. And it's just a lazy error that really, really gets to me. You see it in other um, TV shows too. And supposedly they have a historical advisor about the medieval church on here, and yet they haven't even bothered to get that basic thing right. Just shows you. 